Well, we are going to be in Matthew 16, verses 13 through 20. We are in the sermon series, Not All the Questions in the Bible. And, you know, it's interesting because I received some hate mail this week. Apparently somebody heard the sermon that went out on the radio last Sunday, and it would have been the sermon we did for the fourth candle of the Advent wreath regarding peace. And I said that there's only one way to have peace with God, and that's through Jesus Christ. And if you don't know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, you know, you're in trouble for eternity because you're not going to go be with him. And that was enough to drive this person absolutely crazy because apparently they felt like that Jesus came and just died so that everyone would have a relationship with God and everyone would go to heaven. Um, well, all I can say is if they didn't like that sermon, they're really not going to like this one, okay? Because, because we're going to talk about the question everyone must answer. Once again, we're in Matthew 16, verses 13 through 20. Now, when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter replied, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Then he strictly charged the disciples to tell no one that he was the Christ. Let's go to God in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning, and we thank you for your word because your word tells us what we need to do, what we need to know to have a relationship with you. We thank you for the ministry and the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on our behalf. And I pray, Lord, that this morning you would help me to convey the importance of who he is and what he has done for us. And dear Heavenly Father, I pray if there's anyone here struggling in their relationship with you or struggling to know you, that through the power of your word and the power of your spirit, you will reveal yourself to them in a special way, even as we pray that you will help all of us to have a closer relationship with you as a result of being here. And it's in Jesus Christ's precious and holy name that we pray. Amen. Well, the first point I want to make is that the world struggles with Jesus, who he is, what he came to do. And they struggled in his day. He says, who do men say that the Son of Man is? Or depending on your translation, it might be, who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And what's interesting about that difference in translation is that quite often it's a difference in the Greek text underlying the verse. There's no difference here. It's just a difference in translation techniques and, and what you believe about what Jesus is saying. But undeniably, son of man is the way he likes to refer to himself. So regardless of how you translate it, the disciples know who he's talking about when he says the son of man, even if he doesn't make that little extra distinction there. Who do men say that I, the son of man, am? Well, what are some of the answers? Well, some wonder if he's John the Baptist, but John the Baptist has been killed. So it would be John the Baptist resurrected, which is what Herod wondered in um, Matthew 14 too. You know, has John the Baptist come back to life and preaching now? Is this, is this Jesus of Nazareth really John the Baptist? Uh, others wondered if he was Elijah, perhaps. Because in Malachi 4.5, we read, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. So some thought he was Elijah come back to proclaim the day of the Lord. Others thought maybe this man going about preaching and doing these things was Jeremiah. Um, and you might say, Jeremiah, where does that come from? Well, there was a Jewish tradition that Isaiah and Jeremiah would come back before the culmination of all things. So some might have thought that, oh, Jesus was Jeremiah or one of the other prophets, perhaps Isaiah or some other tradition we don't know about. And I think that this, this 
confusion is the whole reason for verse 20. Because verse 20 seems confusing. That who do, who do people say that I am? Who do you say that I am? And then in verse 20, he strictly charged the disciples to tell no one that he was the Christ. Well, I think he charged them to tell no one because there was such confusion out there about who he was and who the Messiah was. Because in reality, nobody was expecting a spiritual savior. They were really expecting a political king and a military leader. That's what they were looking for, an anointed king to come and shake off the shackles of the Romans. That's not who he is at this point in his ministry. He has come to be the suffering servant depicted by Isaiah 53. And they weren't looking for that. So the whole idea of who he is and what he came to do is so confused in people's minds, he's like, don't even tell them that I am the Christ, the Messiah. Let them come, let them hear me, let the Spirit work in their lives. So in his day, people were confused as to who he was. But they're also confused in our day as well. There are many people that think that Jesus Christ is a prophet. I mean, Islam thinks that. Jesus is one of a long line of prophets teaching about God. Some think he's a moral teacher. One of the greatest examples of that is Thomas Jefferson, who felt like Jesus Christ was you know, not divine, not supernatural, just a man, but a great moral teacher. He, he came up with his own version of the Bible, took all the miracles out of it, left all the moral teachings of Jesus Christ. There are some that do think he's God, but in a little different way than you and I may think that Jesus is God. Um, in Hinduism, they would say, because Jesus said, I and the Father are one, well, he had the God consciousness that we can all be a part of. And then others think that he grew to be God, and that's from the Mormon understanding. Jesus Christ was just a man, but he fully adhered to all the tenets of Mormonism, and when he died, he was awarded with godhood. And he has his own universe now that he's over in charge of. So, you know, there are lots of different understandings of Jesus and who he is, who he was, what his ministry was about. Many would just say that he's a liar. He claimed to do miracles. He pretended to raise the dead. What else is he but a liar and a charlatan? And then some would say he is a lunatic because he thought he was God. C.S. Lewis said, if you look at the life of Jesus Christ, you come to one of three possible conclusions. He's a liar, he's a lunatic, or he's Lord. And of course, C.S. Lewis said, he is Lord. But there is confusion about who Jesus Christ is and was. There was in his day, there is in ours, but his disciples know who he is. First of all, he does reveal himself as the Son of Man. That's the most common epitaph he uses for himself, the Son of Man. And you might say, well, why would he use that term? Well, probably a few reasons. Son of Man was used multiple times in the Old Testament. It was used very frequently in the book of Ezekiel, where Ezekiel was called by God the Son of Man. And by Jesus using that term, he might be emphasizing his humanity, he might be emphasizing his prophetic ministry, or maybe he's using it because there wasn't a ton of baggage associated with that name. Um, then he might also be using it because of what we read in Hebrews 2.6, which is a quotation of Psalm 8.4. What is man that you are mindful of him, or the son of man that you care for him? And the author of Hebrews is using that verse to display the superiority of Jesus Christ over angelic beings. So even though he, in one sense, may be emphasizing his humanity, he could also be saying, but I am more than human. And if we read what Daniel 7, 13 through 14 says, we probably come closest to why Jesus used the term son of man. Because he's not only showing his humanity, he's also showing his 
divinity. This is what we read in Daniel 7, 13 and 14. I saw in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven there came one like a son of man, and he came to the ancient of days and was presented before him. And to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away in his kingdom, one that shall not be destroyed." One like the Son of Man came to the Ancient of Days. Clearly, a uh, more than human being is being depicted here. So Jesus calls himself the Son of Man, emphasizing perhaps his dual nature. He was human and divine, and also his prophetic teaching. Peter, when asked, who do you say that I am?, says that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. So Peter recognizes that Jesus is the Messiah. And the term Messiah, uh, Christ, comes from a Hebrew word meaning anointed one. It probably comes from passages like Psalm 2, verses 1 through 3. Why do the nations rage and the people's plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel against, together against the Lord and against his anointed, against his Christ, against his Messiah, saying, let us burst their bonds apart and cast away their cords from us. So this idea of an exalted king he was the anointed one that they were looking for. And Peter recognizes that, that Jesus is the Messiah, but at this point still has a limited understanding of what that means and probably is still, just like his contemporaries, looking for that military leader, looking for that political king. But he's not only the Messiah, he is the son of the living God. And this idea of this Messiah being a son probably initially goes back to 2 Samuel 7, 12 through 14 with the promise given to David. When your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring after you who shall come from your body and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be to him a father and he shall be to me a son." So here, he is the son of David, but more than that, he is the son of God. I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. Not only a descendant of David, but the son of God. And then, even beyond that, a passage like Isaiah 9, 6, that we so frequently use during the Christmas season, points us to this understanding of this messianic figure, this descendant of David being the Son of God. He shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. But note that this understanding wasn't from Peter's intellect and wisdom. This is from God himself. Peter certainly could have come up with the idea that Jesus was the Christ, the Messiah, because he's thinking of a king. But more than that, he is the son of the living God, not like the dead idols, you know, a living God, real, true, one. And it's because the Father has revealed it to him, but in reality, we understand that it's also through the ministry of the Holy Spirit Holy Spirit, who himself is God, but doing the will of the Father in this case, revealing truth. And the reason I say that I think it's the Spirit working on behalf of the Father is because that's what we're told the Spirit does. First of all, the Spirit saves. In a passage I'm in it, uh, uh, probably too fond of, and I, I share a lot, but John 16, verses 8 and 9. Jesus says, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away, for if I do not go away, the Helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment, concerning sin because they do not believe in me. It's the Spirit's convicting ministry that helps us to understand our need for God and gives us our desire to serve him. The Spirit saves, but the Spirit also superintends. 
As we live our Christian life, it is the Holy Spirit that helps us to understand about God and helps us to understand the Word of God and helps us to apply it to our lives. This is what we read in 1 Corinthians 2, 12 through 13. Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God, that we might understand the things freely given us by God, and we impart this in words not taught by human wisdom, but taught by the Spirit, interpreting spiritual truths to those who are spiritual. It is the Spirit's work inside of us that helps us to understand the Word of God, helps us to apply to the Word of God, helps us to even proclaim the Word of God. So when Jesus says, you you haven't come up with this idea of me as the son of the living God yourself, that was given to you by the Father, he's saying the Holy Spirit has reached into your heart and your mind and helped you to understand deep spiritual truths. And the same Spirit does that for us today as well. The Spirit saves and the Spirit superintends. You know, The world doesn't understand who Jesus is, but his disciples do. The world struggles with the question, who do you say that I am? But disciples know that Jesus is the Son of Man. Jesus is the Son of God. Jesus is the Messiah. Jesus is the one who came to save us from our sins. And it is through that salvation proclaimed to us through the Spirit that we understand how to live And that same Spirit guides us in serving God. His disciples know who he is. He is the Messiah, the Christ, the Son of the living God. And we have a responsibility to proclaim him. Peter has a job to do. He says, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. What does Jesus say? Uh, You are Peter, and on this rock, I will build my church. Peter helps build the church. Now, what Jesus is doing is using a play on words here. Uh, Peter's name, Petros, maybe it was Cephas in Aramaic, means stone, rock, or pebble. So he's saying, Peter, you're a rock, and on this rock, I'm going to build my church. And he does use Peter in a particularly important way. And we see him using Peter in Acts 2.14. He, he reveals the truth about Jesus Christ to the people gathered in Jerusalem. And in Acts 2.14 we read, But Peter, standing with the eleven, lifted, lifted up his voice and addressed them, Men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and give ears to, ear to my words. So for those that are gathered there for a festival, he proclaims, Jesus Christ. And in Acts 2.41, we read, So those who received his word were baptized, and there were added to that day about 3,000 souls. And the first part of the book of Acts is all about Peter's ministry before it shifts to Paul. So Peter has a very important role to play in kind of the foundation of the Christian church. But note that he does this by proclaiming the message of salvation. Jesus says to him, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Now you would not believe, or maybe you would. All of the commentary and discussion over this particular verse. What does it mean? I mean, the Catholic Church even points to Peter as the first pope and uses that line of dissent that they've come up with to say that the the current pope has the authority of Peter over the church. Well, there's at least one big problem with that that we'll get to, but I'd say there's a whole lot of problems with that line of reasoning. But dealing with this, we recognize that Peter has a certain authority. Peter seemed to be the leader of the disciples at this point. Peter is the person that the book of Acts focuses on, at least initially. Peter is one of the foundation stones, if you will, for the Christian church. And he has authority. But what kind of authority are we talking about here? Well, he's given the keys. Well, a person who has keys is typically a steward. We read about stewards throughout the Bible. They control access. A steward controls access. So Peter, in a sense, controls access to the kingdom of heaven. Well, what does he mean by bound and loose? Well, 
That's used in rabbinical literature to mean forbid or allow. So Peter has the ability to forbid or allow access, which makes sense because he has the keys. And then some even point to the Greek and say, well, you know, literally this says what has already been bound on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever, you, um, whatever has already been loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. No, sorry, got it backwards. Whatever you bind on earth has already been bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth has already been bound in heaven. So what happens on the earth has already been influenced by something that has taken place in heaven. So Peter is given the keys to the kingdom. He's told he's allowed to forbid and allow access to the kingdom of heaven. And how does that happen? It happens through the proclamation of the gospel, and when people believe they come into the kingdom based upon a heavenly transaction that has already taken place, and what is that heavenly transaction? Jesus Christ dying on the cross for our sins. Peter, by proclaiming the gospel, is letting people into the kingdom when they believe. And the reason I think that is true is because of Acts 2.38. And Peter said to them, once again, back to Acts 2 and some of the verses we've already talked about. What was Peter proclaiming? The gospel of Jesus Christ. Repent and be baptized, everyone in in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? Well, they believed, and 3,000 souls were added to the church. Peter is told that by proclaiming the gospel message, he will be either bringing people into the kingdom or forbidding them access to the kingdom, but he's not doing it in and of himself. It happens because of their response to what Jesus Christ himself did when he died on the cross for them and presented himself in the holy sanctuary. You're forbidding, if you're keeping people out of the kingdom, you're keeping them out because they have not believed in what Jesus Christ has done. If you're allowing people into the kingdom, you're allowing people in because they have believed in what Jesus Christ has done when he died on the cross for their sins. And the amazing thing about all of this is that God makes it prosper. It's God from beginning to end. Remember I said the Spirit saves and the Spirit superintends? God will make it prosper because Jesus Christ says, Thou art Peter, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell or Hades, the kingdom of darkness, evil, will not prevail against it. And that's because God says whenever he sends out his word, whenever we proclaim his message, he is there and it has an impact. This is what we read in Isaiah 55:11. So shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth, it shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose and shall succeed in the thing for which I sent it. God's word works. And when we proclaim the word of God, when we proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ, when we say this is how you get into the kingdom of heaven, We are inviting people in. And you might say, well, that was given to Peter. Peter is given authority to do that. Peter is given authority to proclaim the message. Why do you say we have that authority? Because the Bible says that it's a job we all share together. It wasn't just given to Peter. And here's the problem with the Catholic Church and their understanding of this. Peter is not unique. Peter is used by God in a special way, but he is not unique. He doesn't have any more authority to bring people in or to keep people out of the kingdom than any of us do. Because Jesus says this a few chapters later in Matthew 18, 18. Truly I say to you, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. And who is he saying this to here? Not just Peter. He's saying this to all the disciples. When he said it to Peter, you was singular. Here, the you is plural. He's saying to all of the disciples, you know what? That authority I gave Peter, I'm giving to all of you. I'm giving you the authority to proclaim the gospel. And people will believe or not believe. They'll either be coming into the kingdom 
or kept out of the kingdom. They will either be given access or forbidden access. And it's because of the message you proclaim. You proclaim the truth. And if they believe in Jesus Christ, if they believe he died on the cross for them, if they believe that he took their sins upon himself when he sacrificed himself on the cross, then they are mine, then they are my disciples, then they will get into heaven, then they are a part of the kingdom, which is why we are called upon repeatedly in Scripture to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now some have said, well, why would I want to share? Because... Maybe if I don't share, people won't have the responsibility to choose, and then they maybe will have a second chance when they stand before God when they leave this life. But that's not what Scripture teaches us. Scripture teaches us is appointed to man once to die, and then the judgment comes. And you're judged based upon what you do with Jesus Christ here on this earth. And there's different ways you can look at sharing the gospel with somebody else depending upon what you believe regarding the work of the Holy Spirit in people's lives. You can perhaps think that I have to share because if I don't share and the other person doesn't hear, then it's my fault that they don't get, have that opportunity to believe. Or you can believe that I have to share because of the responsibility I've been given to share, and it's God's Holy Spirit that does the work in somebody else's heart and life. But the bottom line, for regardless of how you look at it, is that we are called to proclaim the word. We are called to proclaim the gospel. We are called to let people know what Jesus Christ did when he died on the cross for us. We have been given authority to proclaim. We have been called to proclaim. And if we don't proclaim, then we are in direct opposition to the God we claim to love and to serve. We need to be willing to present the option of the kingdom to the people we come in contact with. And we've been given that authority. And we've been given the promise of the Spirit. And we've been told that God's word will not return void. We've been told the transaction has already taken place in heaven. All we have to do is present the option. Believe or don't believe, that's it. And when you think about it, it's not really that hard. But we get so caught up in what will people think of us? How will people react? Maybe they won't want to talk to me again. Maybe they'll say nasty things about me. Maybe I'll get hate mail. There you go. You know what? It's going to happen. Jesus said, you know, they hated me. They're going to hate you too. It's just the way it's going to be. We just have to make a decision whether we're going to serve God or give in to our fear and not do what God has told us to do. Because it's right here in black and white. He says, I give you the power, I give you the authority, I give you the ability. You just have to present the option. That's your entire job. Present the option. And then what people do with it, that transaction that takes place, it's between them and me. If they believe, then what Jesus Christ did when he died on the cross for his sins saves them. If they don't believe, well, then they're lost forever. They go to a place of punishment prepared for the devil and his angels. It's not your fault. You don't send them there. You present the opportunity for life. Now, one of the things we do regularly in this church is remember how Jesus Christ performed that heavenly transaction 
which our salvation is based on. We have been allowed into the kingdom because somewhere along the line, God's Spirit worked in our hearts and lives and someone presented the gospel message to us so that we believed. We remember that by taking communion together. Now, if you have not picked up one of these communion cups yet, I encourage you to go and grab one. And uh, I apologize because we, we've had to change what we're using. And the other ones were much easier to use. However, everyone apparently thinks that they're much easier to use and they're on a three-month back order. So because I didn't order them quickly enough, we, we're left with this. And I want to warn you that it can be a bit tricky to get the little plastic part off the top. So um, you, you have to kind of pick at it a little bit and then you'll get it up away from the foil bottom and you'll be able to tear it back. And there is that delicious wafer that sticks to the top of your mouth. <laughs> but this is not supposed to be a gourmet experience. This is a reminder for us about what Jesus Christ did when he died on the cross for us. It's a reminder of that spiritual transaction that took place. We, we read in the Bible that you know, you know, he presented himself, according to Hebrews, in the heavenly sanctuary and said, I am the sacrifice for people's sins. That's what we remember. That what he did here on this earth is a spiritual transaction that helps us to have a relationship with God. And this is what Paul said about it in 1 Corinthians 11, 23 through 26. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Now, he did this in the context of a, a Passover meal, remembering when God brought his people out of Egypt. He took some of the bread and he broke it. And he said, This represents my body. And by doing that, he was foreshadowing what was going to happen when he was arrested by the Romans taken to the cross, and nailed to it. He gave up his body, he gave up his life for us. And when we take this bread, this wafer, it's a reminder to us of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And as part of that sacrifice... He also shed his blood. And that goes even further into the idea of the Passover and the meal that he was sharing with the disciples. But the biggest thing we need to remember about it is that without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. That was the biggest point with the Old Testament sacrifices. That's how serious sin is in God's sight. And Jesus Christ reminds us that it's his blood that takes away the sin once and for all ways. And when he was at the supper with his disciples, he took the cup and he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me, for as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And that's what we do today. When we drink this juice, it reminds us of the blood of Jesus Christ that was shed as a sacrifice for our sins. And when we do this together, not only is it a reminder of our faith, a reminder of our community, a reminder of what God has done for us through Jesus Christ, it's also a reminder that we are to share that faith outside of these walls. We've been given the authority, we've been given the spirit, the power, the message. We just have to be willing to do it. Because a person's eternity rests on the question that Jesus Christ asked here. Who do you say that I am? Let's go to God in prayer.
Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning and we thank you for all that you have done for us through Jesus Christ. We thank you that through him we have a relationship with you. We've been forgiven of the wrong that we have done and we have been given eternal life when we believe. Thank you, Lord, for Jesus Christ and help us to be willing to take the gospel message out in the world around us. Help us to be willing to ask others the question, who do you say that Jesus is? And it's in his precious and holy name that we pray. Amen.